the transfiguration. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just, the, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Here endeth the reading of God's holy word. So this week, we celebrate the Transfiguration of Christ. It is Transfiguration Sunday, in case you uh, were not aware of that. Um, but that is this Sunday. And shortly, we're going to be moving into our time of Lent and our preparation for Holy Week. But this day, we pause to consider the majesty that was reflected in the Transfiguration of Christ and what it means for us today. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you all are aware of this, but there was a football game played last Sunday. And I am hesitant to bring it up because I know for a lot of you, it's probably still a sore subject the way that it turned out. I know I am still mad about the 1995 Super Bowl that the Steelers lost to the Cowboys. Uh, and I have a vivid memory of kicking a baby doll across the house in 2011 when the Steelers lost to the Packers in the Super Bowl. And I can remember a four-year-old Madison yelling at me for kicking her baby doll. So I hope that just bringing up the fact that there was a game played last week, that doesn't stop you from hearing the rest of the sermon today. But I bring the game up because of all the hype that gets built up around it each year. It is such a big deal in this country. People who couldn't care less about football all the rest of the year, suddenly they are experts on a cover two defense or the run pass option, or the RPO offense, whatever, uh, and they, they suddenly they care about this. It seems to take over all of our news uh, for the week. Does anyone remember anything that happened last Sunday in the news? Good soup. <laughs> there was good soup, okay. How about the sermon for last Sunday? Does anyone remember what that was on? And it's okay if you don't. I know that we had a lot going on at church last week. Uh, and I know that there was a lot going on outside of the church last Sunday. But you see, that is the proportion that we have blown the Super Bowl up to, though. We have parties. We have special foods, right? Uh, people talk about the commercials, the ones they liked and they didn't like. Did you like the halftime show? Who even was the person on the halftime show is what I often hear people say these days. You know, we debate things like, uh, did Gronk really miss the kick of destiny in the commercial? Or was that all CGI? Um, we really do overhype this, don't we? I mean, after all, it's just a game. And I know that sounds weird coming from me. You guys all know my love of sports. Uh, but the truth is, ultimately, it is just another game. But if we can get that excited about a football game, then why can't we get that excited about Jesus and the transfiguration? Well, we say to ourselves, you know, it's not in our character to get excited 
We as Christians, we are to be pious but quiet. We don't shout the name of the Lord in the streets. We pray in our quiet places. We don't talk about the blessings that God gives us. We simply thank him and move on. Lest we seem to be bragging about what he has blessed us with. See, there's this idea that we simply say thank you and move on. And don't get me wrong, I am a believer in piety and, uh, and quiet piety. That is how I was raised. However, there comes a time and a place where we need to be able to express our thanks to the Lord out loud. Now, some of us, it's easy for us. We don't have that problem. We are, we are able to simply shout those things out. But for some of us, it is very difficult. For Peter, James, and John, that moment where they could no longer hold back I believe comes to them during the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain. Now these disciples, they had seen him work his miracles. They had already heard the message that he was speaking to the people and seeing how it was changing their lives. And they had experienced those miracles and the changes in their own lives. But at this moment, when Jesus stands on the mountain and is changed into a celestial being and the great prop, prophets of Moses and Elijah stand with him, then they truly begin to realize Jesus' ultimate power. He's not just a special man. He's not just a prophet. He's one of the big three now. That's what they see. And Peter, in his excitement, he exclaims, Oh Lord, let me build a shelter to you. Thank you for letting us be here. It's good that we are. Let me build a shelter to you and to Moses and to Elijah to mark this area as forever holy for our people. Let me do so as they know that the miracle that took place here. Now, Peter, as always, oh, so close, yet so far away. You see, he gets so excited and he says by what he sees and who can really blame him that his mouth begins to get ahead of his mind. I think we can all relate to that happening to us a time or two in our own lives. And for some of us, myself included, perhaps more than a time or two. But as he is speaking, as Peter is speaking, God speaks. And he tells them that this is his son who is who he loves or who is beloved, depending on the translation, and finishes by telling them, listen to him. Now it becomes clear that Peter is messed up. He has put Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah. And while that is some great company, it is clear that Jesus is indeed above Moses and Elijah. The disciples fall to their knees in fear because in much of the Hebrew tradition, to hear and to look upon God leads to death. But as they have fallen down and are hiding their faces, Jesus comes to them and says, don't be afraid. Stand up. And he has come back into his human, his human form. And as they are walking down the mountain, he says, Oh yeah, by the way, the greatest thing that you have ever seen in your life, I'm going to need you not to tell anyone about that. Well, at least not yet. But why then? Why would God make this great spectacle for them to see if they were not allowed to talk about it? Well, first it is to show the disciples the power of Jesus. It is for them to know who he is, that he is who he says he is. Next, it is important to note that Jesus does not say, never tell anyone about this. Take this to your grave and never speak of it. He says, do not tell anyone about this until I am raised from the dead. Well, why? Why put that stipulation on, on what clearly is an awesome sight? Well, I think we can look at it this way. It is done to ensure the people that are choosing to follow Jesus are doing so with faith. You see, it would have been awful easy to convince people if he transfigured in front of them every single time he spoke that he was the Son of God. What more would people need to see, especially those that are prone to believe only what they see? So by keeping this story until after his resurrection, it keeps that important part of faith 
in him as part of the equation for salvation. You know, we often talk about that uh, amongst ourselves in, in classes. I've, I've heard it posed so many times. Why doesn't Jesus just come back and show everyone that he is the Son of God? Why doesn't he just come and appear to us right now so that everyone can believe? Well, he doesn't because there is a need for faith in him. There is a need to believe in what is not seen. But what does it all mean for us today? What is the transfiguration? And who was the transfiguration for? Well, it is a powerful example of who Jesus was when he walked this earth, fully man and fully God. I think the most important thing that I take away from the story of the transfiguration is a reminder. It is a reminder that our purpose is first and always to worship God. Peter wants to build tents. Peter wants to run and tell the story after. But when he finally realizes that it is more important for him to do is just to bow down and worship in the presence of God. See, we find ourselves so distracted by the things that are offered to us in this world that we almost forget that our first purpose is to worship God. We often write it off as well. I don't want to throw my beliefs into other people's faces. I don't want to be a blowhard or a braggart. That's why we don't go ahead and worship openly all the time. But praising God is not throwing our beliefs in others' faces. Giving him praise is not being a blowhard or a braggart. It is the most basic thing that is required of us. I started by talking about the Super Bowl last week. What is something that is nearly all the athletes say after they win the big game? Now, I do not mean I'm going to Disney World, um, as you hear them say, right? But so many of them, when they're interviewed, what do they say? They say, I want to thank God. And when this is done from a place of true thankfulness, it is a wonderful thing to hear. So then... What are we thankful for? What are we willing to fall? Uh, what are we falling down and worshiping God for in our lives? How is it that He has showed you His glory? Now, I would love to hear the stories that you tell about that, but even more, I would love to hear you tell those stories to others, especially those that haven't noticed how God is moving in their lives. You see, the transfiguration is for all of us. That is who it is for. It is a reminder of the power and the glory of the God we are called to worship. So let us do so not just this week, but every single day. My challenge for you this week, though, is that you do take time to worship God and to be thankful to him. Amen.